Welcome to Money Talk. I'm Kim Parley. Great to have you with us. Thanks so much for joining us. The new trading year is underway, but will it be able to capture the momentum that we saw at the end of 2023? Markets posted strong returns at the end of last year, much of that coming from expectations the Fed could start cutting interest rates as early as March. But my next guest says investors may want to manage their expectations as 2024 gets underway. Michael O'Brien is Managing Director and Head of the Canadian Core Equity Team at TD Asset Management. Joins me now, nice to see you, Happy New Year. Thank you very much, Happy New Year to you too, Kim. So you're saying we need to uh, manage our expectations. Well, I, if, if you uh, put it in perspective, we had a pretty, uh, pretty strong finish to last year, November, December, um, just across the board, tremendous runs. So, I guess what I'm thinking is that we pulled forward some of those returns that one, one would reasonably expect to achieve in 2024. I think we brought Bottom. them forward. Yeah, I think yeah. We, we got an early Christmas present. <laughs> um, okay, then what is that going to mean then for when maybe the action finally does happen in interest rates? Maybe just to yeah. back up a bit is what do you expect to see happen with interest rates next year? Yeah, well, I think obviously the, the change in investors' views of um, where interest rates were headed, that's what drove that big, uh, big year-end run. Um, you know, we went from investors being quite pessimistic about, you know, interest rates were going to continue to rise. People were worried they were going to go through 5%. Somewhere around the end of October, you had, uh, you know, a couple economic data points that were a little we more can. reassuring. Yeah. Um, you know, inflation uh, was printing positively. And then, um, you know, the U.S. Federal Reserve uh, Chairman Powell gave what was perceived to be a very dovish press conference in early December that it kind of cemented this view that, um, you know what, inflation's coming down, um, but without really uh, having a huge impact on the jobs market, um, the soft landing is in sight. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's really what set off the rally. Um, but as markets do, I think they might have taken that a little bit too far in the short term. And so when I think about, you know, the start to the year, I'm a little cautious on the start to the year. It doesn't mean I'm negative on 2024 as a whole. It's just, look, let's be realistic. We pulled forward some of those returns into November and December on the expectation that we're going to get a lot of good news in 2024. Mm -hmm. One piece of good news that investors are expecting and pricing in is uh, they think the U.S. Federal Reserve is going to actually start cutting rates in March. Um, when I look at it, the unemployment rate is 3.7% in the U.S. It, inflation is actually higher than the unemployment rate. It seems like an odd time for uh, people to be pricing in rate cuts that quickly. So um, what I'm saying, at least to start the year, is let's expect a bit of a, a digestion phase or a consolidation phase as maybe people get a little more realistic about um, how many interest rate cuts we're going to get in the U.S. and how quickly they're going to be delivered, because I suspect um, as you know, the clock is ticking between now and March, mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to become more apparent that maybe they aren't going to be in quite the same rush to cut rates as investors wish they were. Yeah, so you expect the data to be a bit stronger so, then. So I, I, yeah, so I, and, and it wouldn't surprise me to see maybe interest rates uh, back up a little bit here as they sort of uh, re-triangulate on you know, when rates are going to be cut, how many interest rate cuts we can expect. So, so I just think it's going to be a little bit of uh, volatility or you know, a little choppy at the, the first couple months of the year. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's how I feel. You know, after yeah. Christmas dinner, I'm still digesting and doing yeah. that. Things are still choppy. <laughs> so I, I feel the same yeah. right now. Um, what about the Bank of Canada? What do you see in terms of maybe what the Fed's going to do, what Canada's going to do, and maybe just extrapolate that out a bit in terms of what that could mean for currencies as well, too? Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting. The uh, I think if you look at investors' expectations of the U.S. Central Bank, of the Federal Reserve, uh, they're quite optimistic that the Fed will start cutting earlier than they're communicating mm -hmm. um, and more than they're communicating, despite what's right now still a pretty solid jobs market. Canada, um, I would say the, the sentiment towards the Canadian economy um, is, whether you call it much more sober or much more downbeat, um, I think investors clearly view the Canadian economy as being in a weaker spot than the U.S. economy today. Um, I think investors are rightly perceiving that the Canadian consumer is proving to be much more interest rate sensitive than the U.S. consumer. Um, and so I think investors' expectations of the Canadian economic backdrop are pretty uh, subdued. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in the U.S., uh, I think we're in a position where um, most people seem to believe now that a, um, a soft landing is 
certainly within sight, if not in the bag. Um, so very different trajectories. That would, in and of itself, argue for the central, you know, the Bank of Canada to be cutting before the U.S. Right. Uh, I think the thing that's holding the Bank of Canada, or may hold the Bank of Canada back a little bit here in the short term, is we're still printing some pretty, pretty sticky wage numbers uh, in terms of wage growth, inflation. So the inflation uh, situation in Canada, even though our economy is a little bit softer and our job market's a little bit softer than the U.S., uh, the inflation reports we've been seeing lately haven't really been cooperating. So my guess is the Bank of Canada wants a little more air cover. They'd like to see, um, you know, a little bit more softening of, uh, of wage, uh, you know, of wage increases, a little bit more softening um, on those CPI reports to give them the cover to start cutting. But I think when all is said and done, by the end of 2024, the Bank of Canada will have cut more and deeply than the U.S. will. Yeah, just we have to wait a little while yeah. to actually see it. Yeah. What about the banks? I've only got about a minute here, but when sure. you look at the Canadian banks, um, it was an eventful year, I'd say, last year for many of them. What do you expect to see this year? Uh, kind of like my comments about the Canadian economy, expectations yeah. are subdued. Um, I think the Canadian banks' expectations, I would say, are realistic, that they're facing... Um, a challenging backdrop. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of earnings headwinds facing the Canadian banks, um, but the good news here is that you know everybody's very very aware of those you know of those headwinds. Uh, we're not priced for um, super duper outcomes here, uh, so I think that realistic take on things means that uh, you know even if we struggle a little bit in terms of the macro, the Canadian banks are kind of priced for that. Mm -hmm. If we get a little bit of good news, if we get some positive surprises, then you know, I think that's where there's some, some potential upside. Let's pivot now to energy, which you've been following for, for quite a while. Oil and natural gas, it was pretty sluggish last year. Uh, and oil, wow, <laughs> what a year to start. It's been like, it's been choppy. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's always a volatile commodity. Uh, yeah. It seems like it's getting more so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as the, the years have gone on. 2023 was quite a roller coaster. You know, you go back to, you know, late summer, early fall, and people had convinced themselves oil was on its way to $100 a barrel. Yeah. And now today, sentiment is terrible. Yeah. Um, you know, you hear people talking 60, sub $60 oil. Um, as always, take it with a grain of salt. Um, you know, this is such a a volatile commodity. The paper market for, for yep. oil um, tends to be tends to move the price a lot more than the supply and demand fundamentals would justify. Uh, that's just a fact of, of the oil market. And I, yep. w w it gives us ulcers, but uh, we're, we're starting to get used to it. Yeah, and, and, and you expect that volatility to continue in 2024? Uh, well, I, I think you're going to have your ups and your downs. Yep. Um, I think we're starting the year with very subdued expectations, yeah. uh, which actually is, you know, in, in a more uh, contrarian way, that's that's a positive. Yeah. Um, you know, in, investor expectations of where oil prices are going this year are pretty modest, in my opinion. Uh, there's a view today that there's ample supply on the market, um, and uh, demand is questionable because people are concerned about the economic backdrop. I think as we go through the year. Um, if you go back to 2023, one of the reasons why oil never got to $100 a barrel, why it, uh, you know, it ended on a sour note, was a lot of things went right in terms of supply. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these countries that uh, been very uh, you know, suspect or you know, not dependable in the past, places like Libya, places like Nigeria, um, Iran with the sanctions, a lot of positive things happened there. They, they actually produced more. You know, everything yeah. went right for them. That hardly ever happens. Um, so my guess is in 2024, are we going to get another perfect year where everything goes right, U.S. shale hums along, no accidents, anyway. I doubt it. Yeah. Something will go wrong somewhere. Um, and I think given how negative sentiment is today, it's on the margin, it's that potential to surprise positively when, you know, the market all of a sudden is a lot tighter than people think. Yeah. Um, so I think there will be days when oil actually goes up again, and my, my bet is from oil in the low 70s here today, I suspect it finishes the year higher as mm. opposed to lower. What about Natty Gas? It's, uh, I mean, it's been so warm out. There's no snow hardly anywhere in well, Canada. This is, <laughs> this is the second non-winter in a row for yeah. the Northern Hemisphere, yeah. um, which obviously is disastrous for, yeah. for gas prices. Uh, I mean, as, as frustrating as oil can be sometimes in terms of the gyrations, natural gas in North America has been very, very tough for, for quite some time. And just too too much supply. Yeah. And the key in uh, the natural gas market in North America is 
too much supply here, but a whole bunch of people need it elsewhere in the world. And yeah. so it's getting those li you know, LNG, LNG yeah. facilities built and functioning so that you can export that natural gas and get it to the places where they'll actually pay up. Um, so again, we saw a year where no winter, um, not a lot of fundamental support from, from those types of drivers. Some of the big LNG projects that were gonna take you know, supply offshore um, have been pushed out. Um, so obviously very dismal sentiment. The prices reflect that, you know, NYMEX in uh, New York is well below $3. Um, ACO gas out in Western Canada is very weak. So we're starting again from a, a very low starting point. Yeah. Um, so con in a contrarian vein, that's actually a positive because potentially things can go right. And, yeah. and some of the things that can go right um, that are sort of sitting in front of us are that those LNG facilities start to get completed, right? And yeah. so and then suddenly demand it, skyrockets. So. Exactly. And so, you know, it seemed like this LNG Canada was forever in the distance, but by this time next year it might actually be functioning, it might be up and running. Hmm. Those are real important events for the natural gas market. So again, it's one of those things where directionally you understand why oil, why natural gas prices are weak. Um, but sentiment wise you can see that uh, people have almost thrown in the towel and so there are legitimate fundamental structural improvements that are 12 to 18 months away. Hmm. So that's where it becomes interesting for the stocks. Interesting, well, let's talk about some stocks that's, that are on your radar. We've got about a minute and a half here, sure. but let's talk with uh, CNQ. So CNQ, the thing that we need to remember about oil prices is you know, the Canadian producers have been through some very difficult years. 70 to $80 oil for these Canadian producers, they're still gonna generate a lot of money and their balance sheets are in better shape than they've been in years. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the themes for the Canadian producers is going to be um, as these companies, for example, CNQ, they're gonna hit their net debt target of $10 billion sometime first half of this year. Beyond that, all of their free cash flow is gonna go to buybacks and dividends. Um, that's a big positive. And that will happen without oil at $100, um, that will happen. Um, so that's one of, the the one of the themes that we're looking at is underappreciated return to capital opportunity from some of the big Canadian players. And the risks with these guys would just be oil price and their own expenses, I assume, yes. how they manage that. Yep. Um, Meg Energy. So Meg is, uh, they fall into that same bucket where they're about to hit their net debt target, uh, 600 million upon which, you know, they're gonna buy back a lot more stock and that's their preferred way of returning capital is buying back shares. Uh, and also, Meg is kind of the poster child for light, heavy differentials, where you know they produce those West, heavy Western Canadian barrels that sometimes have traded at very wide discounts. Um, Trans Mountain Pipeline, again, the Trans Mountain expansion, it's been one of these things that just seems like forever to reach the finish line. That will hit the finish line later this year. Um, that has the potential to really improve the, you know, narrow those light, heavy differentials makes a huge beneficiary of that. So it's another one of these structural things yep. that in the moment we're sort of overlooking. Sentiment is poor, but structurally this will change the Canadian market for the better for many years to come. 